Hey there, this is Professor John Gallagher, and I'm so glad you've decided to learn to build apps. Congratulations! I've been a university professor for over a quarter of a century. I've taught hundreds of iOS developers in person and thousands more online. Apple has named me a distinguished educator, and they've regularly asked me to present my work to other teachers worldwide. And it seems people enjoy my courses. I hope you do too. Now this is the same material I use in my university course for undergraduates. That course is open to all students and doesn't assume any prior coding experience. And while we'll eventually move quickly, we'll first build a solid base and I'll always try to bring high energy and enthusiasm. I'm a firm believer that learning to code is one of the coolest things that you can do and I think you should teach coding like you're leading a fitness class. So let's learn big. Let's start with some inspiration. Drew Houston, who developed Dropbox when he was in his 20s, has said that coding is the closest thing that we have to a real superpower. And this is a wonderful way to think about coding. It allows you to take your vision, turn it into something creative, hopefully something that makes you happy and that can help other people. And hopefully you find that there is a really lucrative and fun career in this as well. So let's start helping you acquire that superpower so you can become a coding hero. Now, before we dive into programming in Swift and learning to build apps, we've got to make sure that you've got a few things. First up is an Apple developer account. So pull up your browser and go to developer.apple.com. Now you'll probably see a screen that looks a little bit different than this. Apple is constantly updating this with new resources and new information. Now there's good news. The base Apple developer account is free. And there's more good news. If you've been using an iOS device, if you've ever bought anything over iTunes or in the App Store, used iCloud or Apple Pay, then you've already got an Apple ID. So what we're going to do is simply link that Apple ID to your new Apple developer account. So click the account link at the top of this page. And if you don't have an Apple ID, just go down here to where it says create yours now. Otherwise, just log in with the email address that's associated with your Apple ID and use that Apple ID's password. You might be asked to authenticate with a passkey or two-factor identification. And if you haven't created a passkey, that's always a good idea. And you'll also be asked to approve any terms of service associated with your Apple developer account. Now, you might also see invitations to join Apple's developer program. But know that setting up an Apple developer account is free. That's all you need to start learning how to build apps using Apple's free Xcode software. You do not need a paid Apple developer account. Now, when you are ready to submit apps to the App Store, then you'll need a paid account, and that's usually $99 a year for U.S. developers. Now, even with the free account, you're going to be able to install apps directly on any device that's connected to your Mac. But as of this recording, if you have the free account, those apps expire in a week and need to be reinstalled. This isn't a big deal when you're learning, but if you give your apps to friends and family, know that they will need a reinstall in a week until you're a developer program member. Now, some more good news. If you're taking this course as part of an educational institution or if you're part of a nonprofit organization or an approved government entity in certain countries, there are ways to waive that $99 fee to avoid the seven day timeout. Now, you can search online for more information about this. And if you're taking this course as part of a university or school program, your instructor may have some more details. Now, for those of you that do create apps and submit them to the App Store, please let me know. I love trying out apps from former students and sharing the success of students who have learned from my content. It's super rewarding to hear from you, so please stay in touch. Now, let's talk the software that we need to build apps. The software we're going to be using to build apps is called Xcode. It's Apple's professional development software. It's free, and it's the same stuff that all of the developers at Apple use when they write your iOS, iPad, Watch TV, Vision OS, and Mac software. Xcode is an IDE, or integrated development environment. And in the way that you use Excel to create spreadsheets or Word to create documents, you use an IDE like Xcode to create programs like apps. Now, IDEs don't only allow you to edit programs, but they typically have debugging tools. Xcode will also simulate iOS devices on your Mac so that you don't need to install code on a device to test it. Google has something called Android Studio. Microsoft has Visual Studio. There are lots of other IDEs available for particular development environments, but Xcode is definitely the best choice for building products that run on Apple platforms. Now, before installing Xcode, I strongly recommend that you upgrade to the latest release version of Mac OS, not the beta version. Xcode might even require the latest version of Mac OS to run. Now, before we download Xcode, know that you're going to need lots of space on your Mac. The App Store might say that you need about 4 gig to install Xcode, but that's a gross underestimate of the space that you need. My install takes up about 12 gigabytes of space, but there's also a bunch of additional temporary files that are used as part of the installation. There are additional files that you need for simulators and other utilities. You might find that you need as much as 30 to 50 gigabytes of free space for a proper installation. Now, some of that will be deleted after the installation is done, but it still requires a lot of extra code, so make sure your hard drive has enough space. Now, if you need to, you might want to download a tool like Clean My Mac from the App Store to free up some disk space. And if you need even more space, you might want to move items to the cloud or get an external hard drive. Now, this course is going to use Xcode 26. And as I record this, just before the start of the fall 2025 semester, Xcode 26 is currently in beta. 
You can double check this by going to the Mac App Store and searching for Xcode. And if it says Xcode 26 here, then download that version, you're golden. But if you're seeing an earlier version of Xcode, skip this version and instead open a browser and search for Xcode 26 download. Now we will upgrade to all the latest Apple software when it's out of beta. That usually happens after Apple introduces new iPhones in September, but the Xcode 26 beta is stable enough for us to begin with. And there are enough differences between Xcode 26 and the previous version that I think it's best to start here. Now I do not want you to upgrade your Mac OS to beta. I think that's too risky for something like your computer operating system, but once Mac OS 26 Tahoe is out, we'll all upgrade to that because that's going to unlock more AI features that are in Xcode 26. So when you get to the beta page, download the latest version, and if you have a beta version later than this, definitely get that. You might have to sign into your Apple developer account again. Just select the version for Apple Silicon. You don't need the universal version. I mentioned to all my students that they needed a Mac with Apple Silicon to take this course. All the features we're going to use are not available on Intel-based Macs. And again, your installation is going to take up way more space than is listed here. It could take some time to download, especially if you don't have a fast internet connection. It's probably saving to your downloads folder. Find what was downloaded. Click on the .xip file to uncompress. Then I'm going to drag the Xcode beta into my applications folder. And I'm also going to find it inside there. And I'm going to drag it into my dock because I like to have it accessible. But our installation isn't done yet. It's going to take up some more time. You've got more to do. So launch the Xcode beta you just downloaded. Then approve any license agreements. You may need to type in your Mac login password for approval. If there are any other requests, just approve them. Now, when you see this screen asking which additional components you want to install, at this point in the course, all you should select is iOS 26. We're not going to use any of the other components, and you can always install them later. Now, also make sure that you've clicked on predictive code completion model. That'll give you the AI model so that we can take advantage of Apple's predictive code completion. It's not great, but we're going to see what it's all about in class, and we'll use it occasionally. Then click download and install. You'll see a box with a bunch of progress bars letting you know things are downloading, but eventually the progress bars will stop. You can click on the red traffic light to close this box and you're ready to use Xcode. And since we just installed Xcode, we're not even going to create a project yet. We're going to add our Apple ID and our GitHub ID. Now to do that, head up to the Xcode menu and select settings. And in this dialog box in the left hand side, click on Apple accounts, then click add Apple account. And then enter the email associated with your Apple ID. That's the same one that you just used to link to an Apple developer account. Select next, enter your Apple ID password, press return or select next. And there's a chance the first time that you do this, you'll be asked to approve some things from a security standpoint, just to prove anything that you're asked to. And now your Apple ID is your developer ID in Xcode. So now let's set up your GitHub account. Now, if you're new to software development, you probably don't have a GitHub account. So open your browser and head to github.com and click on sign up for GitHub and get your new account. That's also free. Now, GitHub is one of the most important sites in the lives of software developers. Microsoft actually bought this company for several billion dollars a few years back, and GitHub is a few things. First, it's the largest online software repository in the world. Think of it as a big library. It's a great place to go and look for code examples, some projects that you want to learn from, or projects that you want to build off of or contribute to. Now, GitHub is also a tool for version control. In this way, you can consider GitHub as a place where you can back up versions of your projects to the cloud for safekeeping. So in case anything happens to your code and you want to go back to an earlier version and use that, or if you want to build off of an earlier version of code without interrupting the original copy, you can do all of that by using GitHub. Now, GitHub is also a great tool for team collaboration, so several people can work on the same project at the same time. And your instructor might even set up a classroom GitHub account so that you can submit projects and assignments for class. Now, GitHub is also a place where you can post your software development portfolio online for others to see. And most employers that are hiring software developers today look at the public accounts of potential employees to get a sense of what kind of projects someone has worked on, their learning progression as a software developer. And because of that, you probably want to add your GitHub account to your LinkedIn profile too. And now that you have a GitHub account, head back to the Xcode accounts tab in the preferences box, click the source control tab on the left, Enable source control should be checked. Then under accounts, click add account. Then in this account selection box, select GitHub, not GitHub Enterprise or any of the other types of GitHub, just plain GitHub and click continue. And under account, enter your GitHub user ID. And you'll see you're being asked for a token. Now GitHub has switched to using tokens instead of straight passwords for its security authentication. And you can get a GitHub token by clicking on this button that says create a token on GitHub. This opened my browser. It's gonna ask me to log on to GitHub again. For note, I'm just going to say token for Xcode 26. Then I'm going to set the expiration to no expiration. And when you're working in industry, you'll always use expiring tokens. But for my personal use, since I've got pretty good password hygiene, I'm going to make it easy on myself and choose no expiration, even though the security gurus at GitHub don't recommend this. 
And then underneath this, select the scope of access or how much access the user of this token gets. Now, frankly, by clicking on repo here, that'd be the bare minimum. But since I use GitHub pretty extensively via Xcode, I'm gonna select everything. Now you'd wanna be a bit more conservative with security if you were worried about someone else having access to your Mac and your employer will likely have far tighter security. If you're curious about how scope works, you can click on read more about OAuth scopes for more documentation, but selecting everything is gonna be fine for me. So I'll scroll down and check everything. And so with everything selected, I'm just gonna click on this green generate token button. And this very long alphanumeric value that's generated is the token that we need to paste into Xcode. So you can either click on the clipboard icon or highlight the value and copy it, then return to Xcode, paste this value into Xcode in the token field, then click the sign in button and congratulations, you've just set up Xcode to work with GitHub. And with our setup done, you can quit out of Xcode and close your browser. Now also, before we get into building apps, I wanna share some keys to success that I've learned from my hundreds of students over several years of teaching app development. And the first is code often. Learning to program is like learning a foreign language. And the more that you speak a new language, the better you're gonna get. Same thing with programming. Now I've deliberately created the videos in this course to be a half hour in length or less. And hopefully this makes it easier for you to complete a video or two every day. And if you do that, you'll really see yourself progress and you'll have fewer big gaps in time where you don't code and where you might forget what you've already learned. Now students who put off their work until the day before assignments are due almost always struggle. So do a little bit of work every day. You'll find that you retain more of your knowledge. You'll see yourself improve and your learning process will be less frustrating. Now this series is definitely meant to be learning by doing. So you're gonna to wanna to have a browser open while you're watching videos and also have Xcode open. And you'll wanna pause the videos, then tab over to Xcode, complete the steps and build apps along the way. Now you'll also find that it can be very useful after you've completed the video and gone through all the steps to open up a new project or playground and try to repeat those steps without the use of the video or reference materials. This is a great way to make sure that you're really retaining knowledge. And if you struggle with anything, you can go back and rewatch the video, try again. Also make sure you try the challenges mentioned in the video lessons. And if you can't get a challenge the first time, cut along with a the solution, then try again later until you got the technique down cold. Also, remember that I've got a Google Drive on my website that includes all of the keynote slides that I present to my students with their challenge exercises and the solutions. These are the same ones that I use with my students, and I release material each week after every week's class. Now, also experiment with new projects and playgrounds. If you've learned techniques, you can always open a new project or a new playground to see if you can apply what you've just learned in a different context. Programming should be wildly fun, and it's especially enjoyable when you start to build your own stuff. Even if it's just small parts of an app or experiments with a technique that you've learning inside of a playground. So if you're wondering, hey, I wonder what would happen if I do this, or if I make a change to the technique that I just learned. Well, just give it a try as those questions arise. You can do it as part of a new project or playground so that you don't mess up your existing work. And this is a great way to strengthen your skills as a software developer. Now, AI can be a great help, but can also make you a very bad developer if used poorly. So you absolutely don't want to simply copy and paste code from AI results or blindly accept all of AI recommendations. Your instructor may have specific rules for you to follow if you're taking this as a course. But I tell my students that AI can be a great learning tool. You can paste your code in and ask it to evaluate your work or help you find and explain an error. You can also paste in sample code and ask it to describe an area that you don't understand, but you need to be disciplined enough to make sure that you're learning the basics without AI so that you know enough to be critical of the results that you get back from AI. It often gives you bad results. And also, without a solid understanding of basics, there's no way you're going to get through a technical interview when you want to get a job. Now, many Swift developers swear by Claude AI. Some more advanced developers also use an alternative IDE named Cursor, although I wouldn't recommend that for newbies learning the basics. Now, GitHub continues to advance Copilot, and there are extensions for integrating GitHub Copilot into Xcode. Again, something I really don't recommend for newbies because the code that's generated is often overwhelming when you're trying to understand each line that you write. Now, as of this writing, Apple's predictive code completion that's built into Xcode is flawed. It's only right about 50% of the time, and it often recommends code that's been deprecated, so be careful. But you should absolutely expect this to get much better. Expect big improvements when the release version of Xcode 26 and Mac OS Tahoe are out. Some students learning the basics might actually want to turn off Apple's predictive code completion. That's up to you. Again, check with your instructor. Now, AI changes so quickly that any of the recommendations I have now might be outdated. If you've got some great things to recommend, feel free to post those in the comments. But one of the best ways to stay current is to follow a good group of software developers on social media. Here are my accounts. 
Mastodon and Blue Sky have great iOS developer communities. There are also a bunch of really great weekly newsletters that you can subscribe to for free. I've got a link for recommendations in the description of this video. Now, in prior years, developers found Stack Overflow to be very useful. Stack Overflow is the largest online question and answer site, but with the advent of AI, Stack Overflow usage has plummeted. I wouldn't rule out Stack Overflow for answers, but its use is definitely on the decline. Now, if you do post online, be kind to others. Employers pay attention to that, and having a snarky, mean-spirited online presence is employer repellent. Similarly, it's a green flag if you're kind online and you help others. Employers see that as a strong signal, you'll be a great team member. Now, GitHub can also be an amazing learning resource. There are lots of coding examples online. YouTube and blogs can also be great resources for learning more. And as you go through this material, you're going to be more comfortable looking things up online and learning on your own. And that's a vital skill for anybody working in tech. Now, Apple's also got some wonderful resources online as well. You can explore Apple's resources and find coding examples. There's guidance on user interface design. And also, every year in June, Apple runs a huge event that they call the Worldwide Developer Conference, or WWW. DC. Now, Apple will post all of the learning videos and workshops from these events online. In fact, many of my former students have gone to work for Apple, and it's always great to see a former student presenting their work for Apple at the WWDC. So check those videos out. They're a great way to learn advanced techniques and to keep up to date with new innovations coming from Apple. Also, if you're a student, every year Apple offers scholarships for the WWDC, so keep your eye out for those every spring and consider applying for those as well. Another way to gain recognition is through the Swift Student Challenge. You can search online for information about that as well. And finally, I really want to hear from you. Creating content and releasing videos for free on YouTube is definitely a lonely endeavor. So I really love hearing from people that are using this work, who are learning from these videos and having fun. So whether you're an instructor, a classroom student, or an independent learner, please take time to drop a comment below the YouTube videos. And also do know that if you like or subscribe, that's also used by YouTube and their search algorithms to surface these videos. And that can be tremendously helpful to me as I try to reach even more students. So if you take a small amount of time to do that, you've got my sincere serious thanks. Also, if you're an educator, do share this material with other colleagues. It's great to get the word out there. And as an added bonus, if you take a photo or a screenshot of what you're doing based on what you've learned in my videos, and you post it online with the hashtag BuiltWithProfG, every week or so I randomly select a poster to receive one of the much-coveted MyMacBuilds apps laptop stickers, and I mail those anywhere in the world for free. So share your work under the hashtag and you might win one too. Now also, if you're curious, I've got lots of other course content online as well. I also teach a course in physical computing using CircuitPython. You can find that on my other YouTube channel, that's Build with Prof G. So for example, you'll see maker and engineering content videos on things like how to build a robot that you can control from an iOS app, or as a way to use an iOS app with a Raspberry Pi to get it to play sounds remotely, a sort of online ventriloquism, always fun. Seeking Professor G, you are. Come to the right place you have. And if you follow on the socials, I often share announcements of related materials on there too. So I'm really looking forward to celebrating your success. Thanks so much for letting me be part of your coding journey. I hope you have a lot of fun at this. Now it's time for big learning. Giddy up.